This episode is brought to you by EnviedHemp.com. Enved has been my choice for my CBD needs for almost a year now, and I can't begin to tell you how it has improved my life. They come in three formulas, clarity, relief, and relax. I take a clarity drop in the morning with my coffee to get me focused, then a drop of relief for my aches and pains and inflammation after a run or a workout. Then I do a drop of the relax before I go to bed to help me sleep. I've gotten some of the best sleep that I've had in years. Uh, And now with my whoop band, uh, my recovery band, I can prove it. And now they've come out with a new mixture called immunity, uh, which we all need to stave off uh, COVID-19. The immunity boost is a mixture of turmeric, grapefruit extract, elderberry, licorice root, and vitamin C, which we all could use a little bit more, I'm sure. I just got my first shipment in and took my first drop this morning. Uh, They come in drops, which is my choice, a tincture, roll-ons for those aches and pains, and then also gummies, which I think a lot of people out there use the gummies. So you can get it however you choose. So go place your order today. Go to EnviedHemp.com and use the code GURU20 for a 20% discount for life. CBD is a great supplement to keep you healthy and safe during these crazy times. So let's get to this week's episode. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. You know how to cut to the core of me, Baxter. You're so wise. You're like a miniature Buddha covered in hair. I want to become a guru so girls will like me. Then I will like myself. Now before we do this, let's go over the ground rules. Rule number one. No touching of the hair or face. Of course. And that's it. Now let's do this. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Golf Guru Show. I am Jason Sutton, and I'm the guru where it is my job to interview the top golf instruction minds in the business or high performers in all fields of study, break them down, get them to share all their stories, best practices, and information that have made them successful, and then ultimately share it with all of you so we can grow together as coaches and as human beings. Thanks again for all your support of the podcast, and make sure you download this episode and all episodes of The Golf Guru Show. And More importantly, hit that purple subscribe button so you don't miss any future shows that will be coming your way. Uh, Before we get to this episode, I want to give a quick shout out to all my sponsors uh, for supporting me and uh, being a part of this project and and the Golf Guru brand. First off, Swing You and my outstanding marketing team uh, for my app, uh, which you should go subscribe to and uh, download from the App Store. And also, if you want to subscribe to my weekly newsletter, uh, just go to my website at golfgurutv.net and leave your email in the email box. Uh, To my clothing sponsor, Straight Down Apparel, the fall quarter zips, uh, the sweaters, and the jackets are absolute fire. And you should check them out if you're looking for a clothing line. This stuff is just fantastic. So you can check them out at straightdown.com if you want to check out the apparel and all of the, uh, the catalogs there and put your order in today. Uh, also, uh, thank you to Hack Motion. Uh, Hack Motion Golf is the best wrist sensor uh, in the business for the price. Uh, it's a great training aid, and I recommend you go check that out as well. All right, so this is a special episode because I am actually the guest instead of the host. In the last month or month and a half, I've actually been asked to be a guest on about three or four podcasts. Uh, which I'm happy to do because I know how difficult it is to be on the other side getting uh, and booking guests. So happy to do it. And this was Ollie Leet's uh, Read It, Roll It, and Hole It podcast, which Ollie is a full-time putting coach uh, from the UK and a really, really smart uh, guy and and great coach. So I enjoyed this podcast. Uh, So I was happy to post this interview on my show to help promote his new podcast and also his coaching So make sure you subscribe to his podcast as well and give Ollie a follow on Instagram at Putting Hub and you can spell it his name O-L-I-L-E-E-T-T. So 
the two E's and two T's. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this conversation where we discuss some of my putting thoughts and strategies, uh, as well as my podcast and all sorts of parts of my career path. For those of you that don't know how I got here, uh, it should be interesting for some of those out there uh, that are curious uh, because we talk about a lot of things. So thanks again uh, for listening to the podcast and here's to a great 2021. So enjoy my conversation with all elite. Howdy. Which else we got? Yeah. Oh, it is recording now. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I'm recording it. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you may have to send it to me then. I'll uh, email it. I'll email it to you. Yeah. No problem. Perfect. All right. Um, I'll send you the link. So it should work fine for you, shouldn't it, on that? Yeah. Cool. Welcome, golfers, to the 27th episode of the Read It, Roll It, Hold It podcast. Super excited to have a um, special guest from uh, from America on the call today. So, uh, Jason Sutton, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Ali. No problem at all. Super, um, yeah, looking forward to it, man. It's uh, You are the golf guru. That's, uh, that's, that's how you come titled. That's, the, that's what they call me. That's what they call <laughs> you. <laughs> Happy day. So, to give the listeners a little bit of insight on, on yourself... Um, you're, you're a golf magazine, top 100 coach. You've been a coach for 28 years. You've mm-hmm. got podcasts. Um, you, you've got, um, lots of things going on. You've got an app that I downloaded earlier and had a little look at, um, yeah. T- t- tell us like a little bit about those 28 years and how it sort of come to today. Uh, how far are we going to go back? Right. So, I mean, I grew up in a small town in, in West Virginia, uh, really not a big, golfing mecca <laughs> so kind of stumbled into golf uh, played all sports uh, was big into baseball but I played baseball basketball and football uh, had to had to sort of make a choice uh, once I got to high school because golf and and football were the same same uh, season so I chose golf which I think was a good decision looking back and uh, you know played pretty well as a junior player got I uh, got a scholarship to to a small college in West Virginia, played there for four years, uh, then turned turned pro, uh, just went the typical uh, assistant pro route, the PGA route, where I was an assistant in a couple clubs uh, in West Virginia. Uh, I was looking to sort of get into a bigger, uh, bigger section. So I, I moved to the Carolina section uh, in 1997 and took a, an assistance job. Originally, the head pro leaves. For some odd reason, the the GM thought I was ready to be a head professional at 27, <laughs> and and promoted me. So I was uh, I was there for a couple of years, uh, which was great. I learned a lot, and most importantly, learned what I didn't want to do the rest of my career, which was uh, run a golf club, fold shirts, and tell Mr. Habitcamp to play faster. Uh, so I uh, I I fortunately, you know, when I made the decision to start teaching full time looking for the sort of the the best opportunity in town uh, which was uh, the Dana Raider Golf School was a top 25 golf school in the, in the country uh, Dana was a top 100 coach uh, so she gave me an opportunity and and that really sort of spurred my career on to where to where I am now I was there for almost 12 years uh, under her tutelage and sort of gaining reputation getting better at, at teaching and coaching and and then the last nine years I've spent uh, at Carmel, <coughs> Carmel Country Club, excuse me, here in uh, Charlotte, which is a, a high-end private club, uh, which has been which has been great. It's a really special place, a you know, huge membership. So I got my own little academy there. A couple of guys that work for me. Uh, so we're we're just grinding out every day on lesson two. Happy days. Going back to the um, the Dana Academy, what were the hmm. sort of um, biggest things you learned through being sort of the, the head instructor there and, um, yeah, putting a program together, if you like? What was the, the biggest learnings? Um, I mean, there was so much, right? I mean, it was an extremely busy place. I mean, you know, in the early 2000s, golf schools were really booming. And, you know, we were, we were getting 32-person golf schools every weekend um, and then just teaching – a ton right so it's like it's always tell young instructors you know how do I get better it's like get put yourself in a position where you can just teach a bunch and we were doing 
I mean, just crazy numbers. So, you know, it, it, it was so much more than just learning to teach. It was also learning, you know, how to structure a golf lesson, how to manage a group. I mean, we did a lot of group stuff. So, you know, we were trained to really teach, you know, six, eight people at a time. Right. So how do you, how do you manage those people and make sure they're all getting, you know, your intention and, and they're all getting better and, you know, putting together, you know, structuring golf schools, you know, putting together schedules. I mean, there's so much that you can take from, that kind of environment that has helped me now, even though I don't do as many groups now, obviously, but it's, you know, it's, it's all things that we've sort of learned along the way. Uh, but more importantly, I just, it was just an opportunity for me to, to get out and start to build relationships and, you know, start to really work on, you know, getting better as a coach, uh, which, you know, was my only job. So going from where I had six jobs as a head pro, you know, now I just got one sort of basic intention of just, being the best I could be. So there's a lot, there's a lot to it. I um, mean, we can get into it, but I mean, it's, I know we're going to talk a lot about putting, but that was when sort of at the end of that tenure <clears throat> for me, looking back at my career is like, I wanted to be a, a very well-rounded coach, right? I wanted, if a tour player came to me, I wanted to be able to, to teach him in every avenue. I wanted to be able to, you know, help him with his putting, his full swing, his short game and his mental game. So that's when I really started diving into you know, my, one of my weaknesses, like I want to learn more about how to really properly teach putting. Cool. like that. Um, that's, um, yeah, it's interesting to hear the, the sort of journey there. And, uh, as you are saying about the, um, the putting. So is that you, did you say that's something you do want to do or you did? Oh, I did. I mean, that's, I mean, yeah, I was going to say, I'll, I'll, yeah, now, I mean, now, you know, I would consider myself, a part-time putting coach you know, because, yeah. you know, I think it, everybody's like, well, what's that mean? It will mean that when, when players, whether it's tour players, good college players or, or juniors just come to you and say, Hey, I just want you to be my putting coach. I mean, that means that, you know, you're, you're building a little bit of a reputation in that area for being, for knowing something about putting. So not that I want to go out and be, you know, a full-time putting coach. because I don't want to go broke. <laughs> I know how difficult it is. And I have friends that are teaching on tour and, and it's, you know, <clears throat> I just want to be able to help, you know, all my players. And, and I just had a curiosity and a fascination with putting because I think it's one of the most difficult skills in the game. And it's definitely one of the most difficult skills to teach. Um, if you want to do it at a high level, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I agree. It's um, it's certainly a game within a game. I'd say the putting. Hundred percent. I love it. I love it. As you know, as you know, and um, you know, as you, I'm like majorly passionate about the putting. Yeah. It's, uh, and and golf, but yeah, it's cool, man. Um, talk 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 us through, uh, Guru, about the uh, the podcast. What I want to know, and by the way, I'm a massive fan, and I'm not Thank just you. trying to, not here to <laughs> try to. Uh, put hot smoke up your ass but no, I, I promise you I, I love it I watch you know listen to most of them um thanks and you know you get some great guests on there it's always entertaining what I want to know is like why do you do it yeah that's that's a great question I, I think about it all the time because it, as you know now being a podcaster it's a lot of work right I mean it's a lot of extra time that I'm putting into it because especially when you, when you want to do it well, you know, you, you're doing the editing, you're doing, you know, you're doing all the, you know, getting the gas, the research, the preparation takes a lot of hours um, that I'm not getting paid for, you know, with monetarily, you know, not getting paid dollars, but I get paid in so many other ways, which is, you know, having great guests on the, on the podcast, which I learned from, you know, I've built some really some, a lot of a lot of people I have on there. Obviously, I've known before. We've had relationships, but I've had several that uh, that I've had that I've never met, and I have the opportunity to spend time with. And we've, you know, now we're collaborating and doing other things. So, I mean, originally, I would say it was more of just it's a, it was another platform for me to share um, information with other coaches, and then also share some of my brilliant friends that. I'm on the phone with, or I'm learning from and bring it to the, to the masses and help more specifically, probably young coaches is kind of who I had in mind when I, when I started the podcast. Cause I, there, I didn't, I didn't feel like there was any, there's plenty of golf podcasts out, out there, right? There's hundreds of them. 
sure. helping average golfers. And, that, and that's great. So I wanted to, you know, really my passion is mentoring young, young coaches and young teachers and, you know, young professionals that are looking to get better at, at teaching. What, what do they need to do? What's the, what's the roadmap look like? And it's much different now than it was when I was younger. Um, so I'm just helping them navigate that by bringing them the best information and the most accurate information I think out there. Cause that's, I think that's what our job is, is to not just like, just like golfers, we don't want them to get fluff, right? We don't want them to get stuff that the cliches and the misconceptions uh, when they're teaching, because then that brings our industry down. Right. So I'm just trying to basically, as I always say, leave a legacy, which my, hopefully my legacy is that I shared with other people, made other people better and ultimately left the teaching game better than I found it. I love that, Jason. It's, uh, it's great. And uh, yeah, long may it continue, please. Thank you. It's uh, thank you for it's, listening. Uh, it's, it's, it's fab. What well, one thing that's sort of evident speaking to you, in the last 10 minutes, whatever it is, and listening to your podcast and doing the research on you is your, your, your want to help your will to learn is, is sort of look quite unique. What I want to know is like, what, where does that come from? What, what, why do you wake up every morning and want to help people so much? I, you know, that's a great question. I, I don't, I don't, I can't put my finger on probably one thing. And I think, Partially, it was how I was raised, you know, my parents, um, my, my family now, my wife, my, you know, it's just, I think it's just, it's more about just being empathetic with, you know, how difficult it is to navigate, whether it's your career or your life. And, and it's just ultimately just doing the right thing. Right. So it, 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 I always think about, it, it's just the golden rule, right? So it's how I want to be treated is how I'm going to try to treat other people. So I don't think it was always like that. I think, you know, when I was younger, a younger professional, I felt like, you know, a lot of, a lot of coaches out there were sort of guarding their information. Like they came up with it. Like we haven't come up with anything or we're, we're all, we're all stealing and, and, and borrowing information or, or tips and, ta and tactics from other coaches that we've learned from. Right. So I just think it's the right thing to, you know, pass it down. And once you have a staff, you know, which now I have, a, I have a little staff, it's like, why would I not want to make them better? Right. I mean, it just, it elevates me, but also it's, it's selfishly when I share something with somebody else, I remember it, I learn it and I want to improve on it. And then when you get young coaches that are like my coaches that work for me, that are really curious and, and, and great superstars, they challenge me to get better. Right. So it's, as we always say, iron sharpens iron. So when you're trying to help other people, it's not a one-way street. I'm getting, mo I'm getting most of the help because it's forcing me to get better. It's forcing me to continue to grow and learn. Um, but yeah, it's just, I think it's just doing the right thing, man. It's, it's innate. I mean, I ask that question in my podcast all the time. It's like, where does that come from? And it's a difficult one to answer. It's so it's, it's an evolution of just who you want to be and who you want to be, how you want to be known um, by other people like that it's like it's part of your journey and it's absolutely what's yeah. your um what's your sort of your why then what's your where, where is your you, you see your journey going to what's your your big sort of why in in life um i mean that's it's another another good question that i that I reflect on a lot and I, I was listening to a podcast the other day it was not a not a golf podcast but it was a i think it was a performance coach on there and he was he was talking about an exercise that he was giving his players and it was to come up with like six to eight words of how you describe yourself when you're happiest or when you are what you consider successful. Right. And I sort of did that in my head and I was like, it's not about winning awards. It's not about getting on lists. It's not about, you know, any, any, accolades or recognition that, that I get that really fulfills me. It's more about how do I treat other people, right? It's like, how, how, how do I affect other people that are around me that spend time with me, reach out to me that I still can't believe people reach out to me for, for help. I mean, cause I just don't 
view myself that way. Um, I'm still learning. I'm still trying to reach out to other people as well. So it's kind of a continuous cycle, but that's, that's me right there. That's that, that's what fills my cup is seeing other people get better or achieve their goals because of what I've done to affect them. Brilliant. It's a great, um, it's a great legacy to have for sure. And the rest of the cup gets filled with wine. Absolutely. Red wine. <laughs> red wine. <laughs> we can, we can have some long conversations about red wine. It's a, yeah. it's a big, uh, I know it's a massive passion of yours and uh, I, I just love, well, I don't know if I study it, but I love drinking it. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's, that's the best part. <laughs> we'll, we'll come. Yeah, definitely. We'll come on to wine. I think we'll, we're going a bit, we'll go down that rabbit hole in a bit, but um, just sticking to you for now, going, um, who sort of, um, who, who are your sort of biggest influence, influences growing up? Or not growing up, but in just in in uh, your, oh your golfing career, who who yeah, who's inspired you? And in- I mean, it's you know the list is so long, right? I mean, obviously, I mean, I, I think there's there's a difference between mentors and then influences because obviously Dana was a was a big influence on me, mm-hmm. um, just because she invested time in in my personal life and my career, right? And I think that's what a mentor does. But aside from that, I have hundreds and hundreds of influences that, you know, I, that I probably could, I couldn't list every one of them, but they were people that I've spent time with of people that I've, that have relationships, friends of mine now through the business, uh, you know, who we listen to in workshops, you know, who we, who we go watch teach. Um, there's, there's tons. I mean, early on, I mean, guys like, um, Chuck Evans, you know, some of the old, old school guys, older guys that, that really helped me and who I sort of picked things up with Chuck Cook, you know, Jim McClain, Butch Harmon, all those guys were guys you kind of looked up to as, as a young coach. Um, and the, there's a lot more, obviously, you know, Jim Hardy. So nowadays it's like the people that I surround myself with now, you know, John Graham and putting James Rudyard and short game you know, Scott Calx has been a huge influence on me just full swing, you know, with his, his friendship and, and certification that I recommend everybody goes and does that Tyler Farrell, you know, 3d guys, Mark bull, you know, John Sinclair. I mean, <clears throat> all these people that I, you basically, you know, if you're paying attention, um, you start picking up little, little tidbits and little nuggets of things along the way that you sort of put in your toolbox and, use on your lesson tee. And as as I always leave my podcast, I say study, practice, teach, right? So you you do, you do the study and then you go and you apply it to uh, yourself or you go and figure out, does it work in a lesson? And then you go share it with somebody else. So that's kind of the evolution, but there, you know, there's, golly, I, there, there's too many to list. Um, I mean, put, you know, if we t- start talking about putting definitely, you know, John Graham, you know, David or Phil Kenyon, I know you've had those guys on your show. Um, have been great influences and great help uh, to me. You know, Mark Sweeney with, I know we're both aim point guys um, has, has been huge, which kind of got me, got me really pushed in that direction. I think when I joined aim point nine, eight, nine, ten years ago, um, you know, Mike guys like Mike Shannon, I've spent some time with Todd Sones. I mean, whoever, whoever uh, would let me come watch them teach or pick the phone up and, and answer my questions uh, has been has been really, really helpful. And then again, then you start teaching a lot and you start developing your own style and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And, and then that's sort of how we, how we get to who we are. For sure. Mm. So many, so many cool guys you mentioned Mm. there and uh, you know, a lot, a lot of them, I know a lot of them, I don't, but um, yeah. One name that stuck out who's uh, one of my mentors is Mark Bull. And I know you've spent quite a bit with him. He's like one of the coolest dudes uh, I know. And like probably, well, one of the best communicators I've, I've seen coach live, um, you know, what it was perhaps that can lead on nicely to my next question, which was what, what do you think are the, the main skills or the most important skills of a coach? Um, Yeah. Answer that question for me, Jason, then Mm -hmm. talk, what's the biggest thing you've learned from Mark Bull? 
Um, well, just, you know, just recently, I mean, I've sort of studied him a little bit from afar um, and then just recently had him on the podcast and going to have him on again because I, we, I think we just scratched the surface, but um, it just, you start changing your language, you know, when you talk, when you talk to guys that smart, right. It's like, now I, I call people movers instead of, you know, golfers, <laughs> right. So yeah. it's just, you know, understanding how the body moves. Um, and it's more obviously in a full swing perspective, but uh, I I'm, would love to get more into 3d like with putting and I, you know, talked to David about it and he's done a lot of stuff, but I just didn't, I never had the, you know, the 3d equipment to do it. Um, but just, I think more about as far as like what the best coaches do is they have that ability to ask the right questions, uh, gather enough information to make a, a good hypothesis and then they're good problem solvers. Right. And I think that's what we are for sure. As a putting coach, um, it's difficult. You know, I've done a lot of putting, uh, workshops and, and presentations, but it's very difficult to give a blanket statement about putting because everybody's so different. Right. And they're so individualistic. Every, every lesson is different and people come watch me teach putting you know, at the end, they're usually like, well, why'd you do that? And a lot of times I can't even answer that, right? It's a, it's a lot of instinct. I think good good coaches have have that sort of inner voice that, you know, allows them to move and make, make really good decisions. And then also, I think good coaches are willing to make mistakes, right? They're willing to, they're willing to push the limits of what they're trying to do with their player and then know when to pivot when it's not working. Right. So it's a lot of that, right. Communication obviously is thrown around, but um, I think they're good listeners. I think they they do a good job of, again, when you ask questions, it's not just like, because, Oh, we need to know, we know we need to do an interview prior to every lesson, but what are you really doing with that information that the player gives you? Are you just listening to the words or are you truly watching how they say it, what's their body language look like, how are they standing, where are their eyes going, you know, all the stuff, all the stuff that I, which I call kind of the EQ stuff, the intangibles, I think make up a good coach and it's difficult to train, but it's something that's super important, I think, to getting to that next level, because if not, you're just becoming sort of a robot and it's not, um, how would I say it's, you're not, you're not flexible enough to like move in and out of different positions and, and treat people differently. Cause again, it, everybody's, everybody's got their own style, personality, you know, all this stuff. So there's, as I always tell my guys, teaching is a moving target, right? And that's why all golf lessons don't look the same and all fixes aren't, you know, even the same problem can be fixed about a hundred different ways. It's up to you as the coach to figure out which one's the right one. Yeah, absolutely. That make any sense? Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm totally. rambling a little bit. <laughs> no, totally. I think, um, yeah, absolutely. Like the, it's the it, that listening. That's that's something I the biggest thing I've learned from Mark is how he talks mm. about like listen to the question people say. You know, it's amazing yeah. when um, and postural sway. By the way, he come on yeah. to your podcast. What was that? Three months ago? Two months yeah. ago? Yeah, that's right. Is it nearly two hours long? I think I listened to it eight times. Yes. Not even joking. Yeah. The the best, and I'll add it to the show notes. It's the best podcast I've ever listened to. Oh wow! The one Thanks. I always go back to and, and listen to. All credit uh, to him. I, I'll tell you this: I, I'm I'm now working out in bare feet. I'm not wearing you? shoes. Oh yeah, because of him. He's like it made total sense. Like you know, the he, as he said, the your skin is your best uh, is your best shoes, and your best shoes, I'll, yeah. I always work out in bare feet now. What about postural sway? Do you remember him talking about that? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, definitely, again, it, we, we look very closely at how the pelvis moves. Um, definitely, you know, obviously in full swing and it, even in putting, right? So, you know, sway and thrust is, as David Orr calls it. Yeah. Um, lo I look I look at that a lot. So it's like, how, how important is it to get your players stable in putting? I think it's super important, right? So whatever you believe in creates that. You know, I, I use body track and people, 
people don't realize how many times I put people on the putting mat or on the, the pressure mat with putting just to see what's going on, you know, if there's, if there's movement or if there's not. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, getting the joints lined up correctly or in a stable position, I think is, is important regardless of if you're making a putting stroke or swinging at 130 miles an hour. For sure. It's important to stand well. He, um, he was also mentioning when, when he's like, when you're standing still, you're still moving. And I think yeah. he called it posture, posture sway or something is what he called it, which is yeah. something along those lines. But it's, it's interesting because he, he'll talk about perception, reality, and truth. And mm-hmm. I was with Mark last week and I said, you know, I, what I've just said to you, like it's the best podcast I keep. Lit. And he's like, really? He said like, I felt terrible that day. I was really ill. Do you remember? Yeah, his, yeah he was not Jason? feeling well. Yeah, he he's was not like, feeling well at all. And I was like, man, you're bringing it. So thank, I mean, that's why I said, and I, again, like I, what happens on a lot of podcasts, I probably didn't get to half the questions that I wanted to ask him. And, and Robbie, my, one of my teachers was co-hosting and was doing a great job because he, he studies his stuff too. And I was like, man, we gotta, we gotta do this again. So definitely got to get him back on for, for part two next year. 100%. Yeah. And yeah. Robbie's a cool cat. I really enjoyed him. Yeah. He's a, he's a good guy. I want to connect with him. So talking of good um, good guys, like you, I think it's the last podcast you did, or if I've missed one, but <laughs> unless I've missed one, seventeenth of December, Butch Harmon. Yeah. How, tell me about that. How was that for you? Like to, to you know, if there's a golf instructor in the world, surely he's up there. He's he's been number one for how many years, right? I mean, for for a reason. So and it, it, I think and I've known Butch and studied his, his work and spent some time with him over the years, but there's a, there's a few guys that, you know, when getting them on the show that I was a little nervous, right. So, cause you want to do a good job and I had done so much prep work and I, you, you, you would crack up to see how many notes I had. And I was, I had all intentions of going right down the, down the list of kind of how I wanted the podcast, how, how I wanted the podcast to go and that lasted about five minutes because <laughs> he started going off on tangents. So basically I just let, I just basically teed it up and just let him roll, man. It was, so, it was fantastic. Uh, and I, I can't tell you how many um, DMS and messages and even like my members are coming in saying, gosh, I just heard that podcast you did with Butch. That was, that was so fun. It, Cause it, he was, he was just so open and, and honest about, you know, guys that he was working with and his career and, like I said, he wasn't afraid to say, Hey, I, I was in a bad place and this is how I did to get, this is what I did to get out of it. These are the people that helped me. You know, he's just such a good guy. Um, it was, it was really, I mean, it was just an honor to to spend that much time with him and we're two hours and 20 minutes into it. And he's like, I, I got to go to dinner. I'm like, dude, I haven't got the half of my stuff. And he goes, well, we'll have to do it again. Um, <laughs> but it couldn't have been nicer. Right. I mean, I was, everybody's like, well, how'd you get a hold of him? Like I just DM'd him. He's on, he's on, he's on Instagram. Right. So I was like, all right, let me shoot, let me shoot him a DM. And literally five seconds later, he goes, I'd love to do it. And, and no come to find, and you heard on the podcast, he's a fan, right? So he was actually listening to the podcast. I was like, that's, that just blows me away. And when you ask why I do it, it's like, that's the kind of stuff, right? Every, as soon as I figure out that, you know, gosh, this is too much work. I just, I'm, I just can't, I just can't do it anymore. I get an email or I get somebody that says, man, like yourself said, man, keep doing it. You're, you're affecting other people. And I got, I got to keep going, I guess. We'll see what happens. <laughs> but it was, that was, a, that was a fun one for sure. You've definitely got to keep going. Yeah. You're not allowed <laughs> to retire. <laughs> what was the um, biggest learning you had from Butch in that conversation or in perhaps in previous meetings? Yeah. I mean, I think again, how, how important the coaching piece is, right? So it's not, nobody's going to, nobody's going to say that he's like the most technical guy or he knows the most really about, each part of the golf swing or, you know, and that's not what makes him great. Right. And it's spending time with guys like him and like guys like Kevin Kirk, which is a fantastic podcast I did a couple weeks ago. It's like, you, you realize how important it is to have those people skills. Right. So, and he, he'll tell you, like, I I just tell my guys the truth. Right. I'm not going to say that they they're good if they suck. Right. So it's like having, but then again, knowing, what to say and when to say it, when to kick somebody in the butt, motivate them, when to give them a hug. I mean, it was just all that stuff that obviously has made him great. 
and he gets, I mean, you can't argue with the results. He's had some of the best players in the world. He's coached four number ones in the world. I mean, nobody can say that. Right. So it's just like the intangibles and just, again, like going back to what my legacy wants to be is like just helping other people. Right. He's not afraid to share. He's not afraid to, to let I mean, I know so many people have gone to his facility and watched him coach. I mean, he's good to do that. Right. I mean, he doesn't need to do that. Gosh, he, he's achieved everything that a, a golf coach could ever do, mm-hmm. but he continues to get better and continues to learn and continues to kind of give back. So that was, that was kind of the biggest thing I, that I knew, but I'm glad he was able to kind of share it with, with everybody else. Cause I think it was at that podcast, it's going to go down in, in history. I think is one of the greatest. Definitely better than Mark's reckon. <laughs> Better mm. than Mark, better than Mark Bulls. Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, just in a different way, right? I mean, yeah, just yeah, you know, totally the stories, agree. right? Just the stories and stuff. And no, I mean, that's what's great about our game, right? We have all these different, uh, really smart people that sort of bring us together, uh, sure. whether it's 3D guys or putting guys or short game or full swing or just, you know, just great, great overall coaches that that's why, uh, you know, we can't, we can't fall asleep at the wheel, man. You gotta, you gotta keep going and keep moving forward or you're just going to get lapped. Absolutely. Yeah. It's exciting to keep going. Well, that's the, you know, that's I wake up every morning still wanting to, I love the smell of possibility in the morning. That's one of my quotes. I just like, right, let's it. go. So, uh, yeah. So let's, um, let's talk about putting. Let's go. Sure. Let's go. You've got a beginner golfer come to you. First ever golf lesson, or just started at t- took up the game. It's like Jason, golf guru guy, you're the main man here. I want to be uh, putting like a tall player in six months. What does uh, wow? What do you uh, what do you not work on? But yeah, how do you sort of structure yeah. that? And what what sort of skills are you looking for? I mean, I don't get that many beginners anymore, but I mean, it's, it's funny. we I had this conversation with, with John Graham, um, not long ago, I think a couple other guys and we were just talking about like, how would you, how would you teach putting to somebody that knows nothing about the game? And one of the things that we kind of came up with was starting with rolling balls on the green, like with a perfect putter, right? So getting, just, just getting the player to, again, I think one of the, most underrated skills in putting as a learner is being able to truly watch the ball roll, right? Watch it, watching where the ball starts, watching the curve and watching where it finishes. And then in relation to whatever your intention was, you know, I think that's a good place to start is <clears throat> just rolling some golf balls on the green and maybe even just having them roll balls with their hand at the hole and just sort of watching what happens. And then I would, you know, in a beginning situation, I would back into, obviously you got to show them, you know, how to hold it and how to stand and, and start to make, make some little strokes. Um, I would probably start them really close to the hole, honestly, you know, give them some success, have them make a couple of one, two, three foot pots, and then ultimately try to work on some touch, right. Explaining, you know, the length of the stroke and, you know, some of the, just the basics of, you know, sweet spot control and face angle and, you know, just get them to start rolling balls. And I, I'm a big fan of, of putting and, and doing a lot of putting drills without the hole. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, getting them to putt to a ghost hole or, or putt to a fringe or putt to a tee, because I think it takes sort of that expectation of make or miss result out of it. Um, that's, I mean, that's what I would do. It just, sort of back into the mechanics a little bit like I do with any player with less detail, obviously with a beginner, but just getting in the roll, roll balls on the ground and then just have them watch. <clears throat> and then, and then just talking, you're discussing what happened, right. Get them to get them to give you a little bit of feedback on what they see and you know, their ideas. I love that. It's like, yeah, it's they're, they're learning from their, you know, learning from their mistakes early on, aren't they? So yeah, like, right you take away, I think like in the past, how I've prep, you know, taught and put in how I was taught. It's like, right. You grip it like this, you stand like this, you got to do this, you got to do this motion, you know, it's all sort of, you try and build a robot, mm-hmm. the golfer into a robot. And then 
they hit a, a, a five foot putt, 20 foot and they, they're like, that they don't know why. Do you know what I mean? So I think right. it, yeah. I love the way that you, yeah, you learn from your mistakes there. You're rolling balls, you're watching it. Did that break like I expected it? Did it, obviously with a perfect putter, it starts online or if someone rolls it with their hand, they pretty much started online. But they're understanding break and speed, aren't they? And uphill and downhill. So well, and they're learning from their environment, right? So again, it's like that's why I think putting is so difficult because every every putt's its own entity, right? So you have different different environment. The environment changes sometimes by the hour, right? Yeah. So it's not it's not just by the day. Um, green speeds change. Obviously, slopes are different. You know, there's there's a lot there's a lot going on that makes it very difficult to get that ball in the hole hmm. absolutely how, how do you um or is that uh, that's the best way or that's how you sort of train people in their environment to to adapt as you say like a 10 foot putt can play like a five foot putt or it can play like a 15 foot putt can't it hmm. depend on the environment yeah. um talk me through how like perhaps the listeners perhaps a nugget there on judging distance control that the, the listeners could take away? Um, I mean, again, it's, it's like I start every lesson with, you know, the poker chip drill or, you know, putting a quarter on the, on the ground and having them roll the ball and try to stop it on that poker chip. Right. So it, it forces them to basically solve all of the problems or all of the uh, and develop all of the skills that is required for putting, right? Start line speed and break prediction. So um, getting them to roll golf balls and and having them understand that there's the first skill is stopping the ball where they want to stop it. And I think that's, that's got to be the first, the first key that you introduce before you can introduce green reading or, you know, stroke mechanics or anything. I think I basically test my players and then sort of based on what I find and the outcomes sort of back into the stroke. That way it gives me a little bit better insight of like what I'm going to change and what I'm going to leave alone. Um, you know, form over, you know, function over form rather. Uh, as you say, it's like not all putting strokes look alike. I mean, there are some stuff that I think that, that we definitely – enjoy right preferences i mean let's face it i don't care it, i don't care who you are out there teaching everybody has a preference of what they want things to look like mm -hmm. we all sort of gravitate towards that but then the good coaches can sort of like i said make changes based on functionality and outcomes and performance um and that's i think that's the key um, so I, I mean i guess i mean I, I have lots of drills and whatnot but i mean I think that's where you always have to start and then just recognizing, recognizing, you know, the environment, whether it's how, you know, what kind of slope are you dealing with? What's the green speed? Uh, and then just hitting a lot of putts again, you know, changing every so often to where you're not sitting there hitting the putt, the same putt over and over, I think is important too. Um, because adaptability, I think is a very under, undervalued skill as well. I mean, one of the drills that I learned from Phil Kenyon, I was watching him at the masters a couple, a few years ago, working with Stenson was just putting balls through a ghost hole and he would basically vary the intention. Right. So he had one, like six, uh, six inches a foot and then maybe two feet or three feet behind the hole. And then getting them to basically change that intention, every putt, I think is very, very important. Um, so that's what that, that would be my advice is just learning you know, again, having an intention, having a distance choice and then putting to that. And then again, assessing how did we do and then moving, you know, to another putt and doing the same thing. So it's just a lot of that, to that and people aren't willing to do it. Right. It's like, I want to be a better putter, but they aren't really willing to put in the work. I think to, to improve their putting exact like putting can be trained. Um, but you know, let's face it, it's not the most exciting part of the game, right? We're just rolling a ball on the ground. But I think it's it's the most difficult if you're gonna be if you're gonna be really good at it. Uh, I think it can be it can be challenging and people give up. I think I go hit drivers. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. It's um uh, well, I would say it is the most interesting part of the game. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I'm just like 
yeah, it is just rolling the ball on the ground, but there's something about it like, I don't know, I can't hit more than five drivers in a row and I just get bored on the range. But I <laughs> can roll balls, coach. <laughs> I can roll balls on the green, watch it, yeah. hit hit different lines, different speeds as you're talking yeah. about. I listened to uh, the Phil Kenning on your podcast mm-hmm. and uh, he mentioned that drill. Oh, I think you mentioned it to him. Yes. And he was saying how the uh, he's took the coins away for sensor now, so, but they're still having the same intention. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I love that drill. I've stole that. Stole that from me both for sure. And, and you don't you don't need a ghost hole. Yeah, you, know, you can use an old hole plug, right? It's just again, it's rolling it across something and then making it stop somewhere. Mm-hmm. I think is is what's important. And again, if you can if you can do that fairly well, the rest of it becomes more manageable. Hundred percent. Yeah, ma- you're just matching your intention, aren't you? absolutely matching your speed with your intention or matching mm-hmm. your intention with your speed uh yeah one of the whichever way around it is they're kind of one and the same right it's capture speed and you know again it's it's basically starting with that in mind and then building the picture backwards mm-hmm. um and and helping them understand that there's not just one solution to the problem right so even though you know aim point we we say ideally we'd want the ball to stop six to 12 inches by the hole that that's not hard and fast, right? We, we can, like, if I got somebody that's putting uphill, I might change the intention to two and a half, three feet, understanding the probability of that ball coming up short, right? Or if it's severely downhill, something I've been sort of messing with as far as, again, like intention versus reality is, is often different as well. If it's severely downhill, I'll, I'll actually move the intention short of the hole, knowing that the chances of them leaving it short is very slim. So they end up sort of falling into that uh, center dispersion ends up being somewhere close to where you want it speed wise. But again, you're now you're taking away the, you know, the probability of three putting or leaving yourself a, a putt. But again, it's like whatever it is, if it's, if you got a player, I mean, I, I heard like, Ian Poulter, I think Mark was talking about, uh, Mark Sweeney was talking about, he likes to hit his putts three feet by the hole, which I don't recommend. But if you do, then he's got to match his lineup, which is going to be different than somebody that wants to drip it in. Mm. Right. So it's just, I don't care what it is. It it just has to match. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, you know, although putting, it is, there's lots to it. It is matching line and speed. That's all we're doing, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um yeah, no, it's interesting stuff. Something you mentioned there was uh like painting the picture. Talk me through um your when you play, what mm-hmm. is your um your what's your what's the simulations you play in your head or what's your visualization or targeting strategy? Um, I mean I would say and I'll share I'll share with the listeners too that the something that we learned from from Mark Sweeney a few years ago. That's, that's really, I think, taken my teaching to another level as far as teaching the picture is how important, and me and me and JG talk about this all the time is how important the last third of the putt is as far as visualizing. Um, so I, I start with the intention in mind and then sort of work backwards. So if we, if we build, and I do this with every lesson, especially good players, you know, show them the, the different piece or the anatomy of a putt, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the intention, the entry point, and then what we now call the drop point, which is a point on the curve in between the hole and the apex, which would be halfway. And John and uh, John Hardesty actually coined it the, the clown's mouth, the apex, the top of the break, and then your starting point, your start line, and then, then the ball, right? So you can kind of get people to build it out. But one of the biggest things that I've learned that's helped a lot of my players is even if you know the exact aim point, let's say we were reading a 15 foot putt and it breaks three feet and you know exactly where you want to start the ball. Most players tend to see too much curve in the last third of the putt. So the entry point is too high, right? So now, even though you know where you need to start the ball, your intuitive brain is going to start at higher than you think higher than it needs to, especially good players will tend to overread the break and miss it high. So I use a 
cool little device, the, a little ring that goes around the hole that shows you the proper entry point based on the percentage of slope. And once I show them that and then show them where the drop point is, it changes their whole perception of the curve. The curve is much flatter than they visualize. And that way that now they, their internal GPS can match up the line and the speed much easier. Um, and I think if people, if players out there, especially good players out there listening, tour players, I can show you this, but if they would work more on that stuff, okay. Understanding that their stroke is probably not as far off as they think, unless you got just a completely crazy, you know, tendency to, to not be able to start the ball reasonably online, that will help you probably quicker than anything else. And, but you have to practice it, right? You got to go and find a putt. You got to build the, build the picture out. And then what I'll do is <clears throat> a lot of times, once we build the picture out and I'll have strings going everywhere or whatever, and obviously it's really busy. Uh, again, I'm watching the player and sort of monitoring what's the performance like having hit putts. And then I'll start taking things away, right? We'll take, take the apex away, take the start line away, take whatever. So then you start figuring out how they perceive the information and how they visualize for them. Like I've had people that do really well. I had a mini tour player that did really well with all of it. And basically he was sort of that analytical type player where he would, he had to sort of go through the whole process to check the boxes and everything. Every time he would check the boxes, he would calm down more. Right. Where a lot of people, he kind of that Bryson DeChambeau, probably typical thing, right? The more information he gets, the the more calm and the more confident he gets. Hmm. Some people aren't like that, right? Some people just need one. They might just need the intention or maybe even the entry point, whatever it is, but you got to figure that out as a coach to figure out how they best perform and how they visualize. And then obviously the, the performance and the testing is going to, is going to play out. But that last third of the curve is massively important. It seems like every time I get a tour player that comes to me, the first thing they want to know is, is their stroke perfect? And am I starting the ball online? And guess what? Their speed is awful. Right. Cause they they don't, they have no clue what it's, what the, where the ball should be halfway, halfway through the pot or the last third of the pot. And they have no idea what it should look like in order to, to kind of connect the dots. So once you start doing that and you're half, I'm, I'm hour and a half into the lesson and maybe I haven't even messed with a stroke yet and they're holding pots and they're going, Oh, wow. I haven't even thought about my stroke at all. I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, it, not that mechanics isn't important because I, I change mechanics every day for putting, but, I'll back into it to where, okay, this is, you know, face is closing, ball starting left. Yeah, we got to fix that, right? Because now our intuitive and our cognitive start lines and and pictures are not going to match up. So, but there's a time and place and you have to have that sort of, um, I call it reverse engineering, right? So if I started with the stroke first and didn't understand how they read greens or how their speed was, then I think I'd be doing that player a disservice. Um, and I, I couldn't help him. And I used to do that. I mean, I, I mean, I didn't start doing probably the right thing until, again, JG's been a huge influence on me as far as structuring a putting lesson, do more testing, doing more, you know, reconnaissance before I start messing with players, especially if they're playing for a living. I mean, this is, it's a big, it's a big deal. So probably a long, long uh, winded answer to your question, but that's kind of how I, how I roll. No, I love the nuggets um, you gave us there, uh, Jason. And like, uh, as you say, the, I think the big nugget is how people do expect the ball to, to go. They expect to go straight for a long time and then dive off at the end. And as we right. know, it, it's more like a banana. Exactly. And a flatter banana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now that we understand, yeah, drop point, I think, was, was huge because, you know, it, it's just – it's, I mean, you, you don't know it until you experience it and you start talking to players, you start seeing them roll putts. And then, then once they understand that concept, then they can go and practice it and they start to change their visuals and then they start to get better. It's, it's pretty amazing. It is. And it's amazing one and like on visualization, you know, seeing the, seeing the, the, the whatever they see on the ground, seeing it is super important because it improves their skills. Yes. It improves their speed and confidence and calms mm-hmm. them down. But also, it the, I think a key thing I, I took away from what you said there is that there's more than it's finding the best way to visualize for them. Yes, because there's yeah. so many more. There's so many ways to to visualize a putt. 
Yeah. You got to have, you got to have, again, it starts with, you know, what's your, what's your speed and pace going to be. Right. So, I mean, one, one putter that, that sort of sees the ball dying in and another putter that is a bit more aggressive, hmm. they're going to have a different solution and that different start line and, and a different picture. Right. But they, as long as you can understand that and you don't know that until you start asking better questions and, you know, I always ask my players like when, take us back, take me back to the last time you felt like you really hold a lot of putts. How fast is the ball going in? Right. Is it dripping over the edge? Is it hitting the back of the hole? Is it kind of in the middle? You know, so you start understanding. And then when you start doing the poker chip drill, you start seeing patterns of like, okay, well, you told me this, but I'm seeing something else. Let's, you know what I mean? Like, so then you st- cause a lot of times our, our players aren't observant enough to even answer that question. Right. So it's like, you got to sort of lead them into, Oh yeah, that's when I'm pulling putts, I feel really confident. I'm maybe I'm knocking it a little bit farther past the hole. Cause I'm not scared of three putting or whatever it is. Like you just have to gather that information in order for, you know, you to help that player the most. Totally. Totally. Talk us through um, some aim point then Jason talks through like, um, yeah. Aim point and how it helps golfers, how you see it helps. Well, I mean, when I first started aim point, I guess nine, nine years ago, just right when I first got to Carmel, we used to use a chart, right. Which was so accurate. I mean, it's, it, it's amazing. The, the work that Mark Sweeney's put in to the system and, you know, it started with, you know, the line on, on the golf channel, right. It was a, it was a computer model that he developed into a, a teaching model. So, but it was, it was pretty complicated to the average golfer. We had to come up with about four or five different variables. We had to look at a chart and then we had to get an answer. Then we had to go and, and putt. Um, so when he started, when he developed uh, Aimpoint Express now, which the listeners out there have seen players, you know, holding fingers up, it became a heck of a lot simpler, right? So now it's, it's very, very easy and, and takes literally less than 10 seconds uh, on an average length putt to where all we're doing basically is trying to figure out slope value and slope and a side tilt of the putt in between the ball and the hole. And we teach, teach our players to use our, use their feet and feel the ground and then start to, you know, we use levels and, you know, digital levels to sort of check ourselves and train our, train our feels um, to, figure out how much, uh, what the percentage of slope is in between the ball and the hole. And then we hold that, that amount of fingers up and it gives us a nice little picture of where the ball needs to start and what we call sort of the, the putt cone, right? So uh, where the ball needs to start relative to the hole, it gives you, it gives you that cone to where the ball sort of needs to roll in uh, based on, again, your intention guys, we sort of, it's all built in, all the information is built in um, from the chart. And everybody asks like, what about green? What about all this stuff? I'm like, it's all built in. That's always, it's like, it's just trusted. It's because you can't, you can't imagine how easy it is based on, you know, all the information that's been gathered. So, but again, uh, what I like about Aimpoint Express, it allows our players to still be athletic in the fact that, again, you determine your distance choice and how hard you want to hit the ball. And then you can adjust your, your arm bend and all that to sort of match that up. But again, especially for newer golfers, I think they need, like they don't even know which way it's going to break. Right. I mean, it's like Mm. just, just getting them to feel something with their feet and use their proprioceptors scepters and their balance just to fil- figure out the direction I think is, is massive. Like I even, I don't push aim point on all my players, like, but I'll show them when I do green reading tests. I mean, I'll show them how much they suck. You know I mean? That's the, that's, that's kind of what we're doing when we're testing is like showing them it, typically a player comes to you. They're not putting very well anyways, right? Something's going wrong. You don't ever get somebody that comes in. Yeah, I'm putting great. Why don't you give me a lesson? Right. So something's going, something's going wrong. So usually if it's a green reading problem, mm-hmm. then, We'll figure out what's going on and, and then, but at least get them to use their feet, right? Walk around a little bit, even if they don't want to use their fingers and don't want to do the whole, the whole system. I always tell even, even good players, I'll tell them 
you sh it's, it's worth going through the whole process just to get the information. Then it's up to you to decide what you want to use. But I guarantee if I was playing for a living, I would be on that so fast that it's ridiculous. It's a slight, as I say, it's a slight edge that I think if you think you can just sit there and look at a green and be a great green rememberer and, and putt at the highest level, I think you're crazy. And even the best players in the world don't read greens that great. Okay. They just ball strike their rear end off sometimes and, 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 and shoot a score. But I mean, I think it's fantastic. I mean, I, it's, it's a game changer for anybody. Uh, I would highly recommend it. Awesome. Sounds good. Okay. Let's, um, let's finish with, uh, what is the best bit of advice you've been given? Then I want you to give the listeners one best bit of advice from the golf guru to finish with. And the third bit then is a, uh, a two minute chat about wine on, I want you to, to give us a lesson on what on um, selecting wine. Oh gosh. So, so the, the first, that was about six questions in one there. Three questions. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start with best yeah, just, bit of advice you've ever received. Oh man. Um, that's a tough one. I mean, it's, it's in respects to like just career or life, life. Uh, somebody told me once, stay humble, stay nervous. <laughs> I think that's a good that's a good life lesson that you can apply to pretty much anything. Um, I think if you get, if you get and Dana used to, it wasn't Dana, but Dana used to say things to me all the time that sort of was up that alley. Mm -hmm. um, basically try to always be uncomfortable because if you're uncomfortable, you're growing. So if you're too comfortable, then you're probably standing still. So I'm always trying to like, put myself in, put myself in positions to, to get uncomfortable. Let's just, you know, that was like the podcast, right? I was, I was nervous. I didn't know what I was doing. I'd not, you know, I wouldn't say I'm the greatest, greatest on the mic. Um, so I, I think that's, that's good. That's good advice for, for anybody in, in all walks of life is just try to put yourselves, I mean, just stretch, right? I mean, it's like people don't, People don't realize when I was a young professional, how shy and backwards and I was afraid to talk to people. I mean, I almost got fired from my first job because I wouldn't speak to the members. Hmm. I was just, I mean, I, I was just shy, right? I, so I had to come out of that. And that was one of the things I worked on early on. I knew to be a top coach, I needed to improve my presentation skills, my communication skills. And it didn't happen overnight. It's something I worked on. Like I went to classes, I read books, hmm. I practiced in the mirror. Like it's just, you know, things like that. It, I was terrified to get up in front of three people and give a, give a presentation, you know, much less hundreds. And I've spoken to hundreds, hundreds of people now and my peers, um, which just made me super uncomfortable, but the more you do it, the better you do. So I'm kind of looking for that next, always looking for that next big thing. What was the second one? Advice um, to the, advice to yeah, the listeners. Get like some, some, some low hanging fruit mm -hmm. that you can give them like tip of the day. So for, for average golfers, yeah, let's, I to, would say, yeah. To I would reduce say, their handicap by a, between five and 10 shots in one round. Oh, wow. Um, no, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll give them just a broad answer. Um, not so much a tip, but there's so much information out there now on the internet and I've, I'm putting just as much out there as anybody, but I would say find yourself a good coach that has a good reputation, do your homework, ask a lot of questions, but you need to have an expert in your, in your, on your team that can help you filter out the information that's good for you and not good for you. Right. There's lots of great information out there, but it's not always applicable to whatever your, your tendencies are in your game, whatever you're trying to change. Um, so I would say, you know, as we, do as coaches we're trying to raise our students golf iqs by helping them understand themselves first right how, how are they moving again i would hope that one of my players if you called them up on the phone and said hey what are you what are you working on and what, what's your tendency they could tell you um it's, which is a skill in itself right 
Sure. So you've got to have a, have that filter uh, and then, and then trust the coach. Right. I mean, and understand that, understand that learning is not a straight line deal, right? There's a lot of ebbs and flows. You're going to get worse. You're going to get better. You're going to get worse. I mean, it's just part of the learn. And we're, we're trying to learn what I think is the hardest game in the world, right? People don't realize it's the best game, but it's also, that's why it's the best because it's so challenging that I don't pull any, any punches and tell people that golf's hard. Okay. <laughs> you get that question. Well, why am I doing that? I'm, I don't know. Golf's really hard, man. You can't, it's, it, you, there's just no way to explain it, right? Mm-hmm. You're not going to be great every day. You're not going to be your same self every day. Your body changes. Um, but the people that adapt and the people that can not get so frustrated, I always say, get fascinated, be fascinated instead of frustrated, figure out, let I me mean, be curious. Instead of just getting pissed all the time, like, oh, figure, why did I do that? Well, what, what happened there? Like, get more information. I mean, it's just, it's just all of that stuff. Like, like I said, it's a moving target for the students, just as, as easy as it is for the, for the coaches. But that's a, that's a, that's a long answer, but it's a very important part. I think if you're going to get better as a player is learning how to sort of sift through all the information that's out there. I love that. I love that. It's um, yeah, there's so much, isn't there? There's so much mm. out there. You can get like, if you said improve your putting, you, you type that into YouTube, there'll be a million videos you can watch. Yeah. And, and there's conflict. conflicting information. There you go. Yeah. There's conflicting information that, you know, you got to figure out, you know, what's right and what's wrong. I mean, or what's going to work for you. And there's, I mean, they might both be right for, for somebody, right. It's just the, mm. It's difficult. That's why it's tough. It's, it's a, such a cool game, but it's such a hard game. Do you know what though? Moving on to wine, mm. it's the same thing. Mm. It's the same thing, right? It's like there's so many wines out there. Like there's like, like how many grapes are there? Like thousands of grapes. Right. Countries, price points, fruit, and yeah. all these different. So talk, talk, talk. Give us a a tour guide for dummies. Yeah. Like we were talking about before we started recording, it's like, basically the thing is to just go drink. (laughs) I'm not an expert in wine. I just drink a lot of it, (laughs) but I mean, it's just, it, it, I mean, it seems simple, but it's true, but I'm just like, I approach anything in life as I'm always trying to like figure out, you know, the ins and outs. Like I'm fascinated, like how it's, how it's being made. And like I said, the different grapes, um, documentary on netflix called psalm it's about it's about how uh sommier like master sommiers become master sommiers and i think that was that's cool like i try to read as much as you can um i use an app i was just gonna pull my phone up here i use an app called vivino it's v-i-v-i-n-o yeah when i before i buy any wine i always you can scan it and it kind of tells you a little bit about the wine, tells you the rating. So I don't drink, I try not to drink anything that's under a 3.8 rating, but again, it's like it. there's plenty, there's plenty of 15, 15, 20, like 20 to $30 bottles out there that will taste just as good as a $150 bottle. And we were talking about the one I had on, on Christmas. I mean, it was fine. It was $150. I, I got it in a wine club. I didn't buy it, but you just sort of, and then start taking notes. Right. So, you know, keep a journal on like what you, what you bought, what you drank. Why did you like it? Um, we do like little wine tastings here. We're trying to educate my kids, which you know, my kids are barely old enough to drink. So I'm not sure that I'm a father of the year, but I'm trying to pass it down a little bit to where I try to, you know, when they, when they drink it, like talk about what you're tasting, you know, is it what pull out whatever your, whatever your palate is, is and it's going to change. Right. And you add food to it you start pairing steaks or chicken or fish or chocolate or whatever, it's going to make the wine taste different. So there's just a lot to it, but again, it's just study it. Um, And the more you drink, the more you start to figure out what you like. I I don't enjoy white wine. I mean, it's just, I I have a couple that are, that are okay, but I'll drink a rosé occasionally if it's, you know, during the summer, but I'm a red, I like a red, like a bold, you know, and I like wines from all different countries. I mean, I love New Zealand and Spanish wines and Italian wines. I mean, I just, I'm just fascinated with all the different regions and grapes and 
what years. I mean, there's just, there's a lot. Um, you can get Wine Spectator. There's a good mag, a good magazine um, where you can start to learn more about it as well. But it's just getting in there and digging around and figuring out what you like, honestly. I love it. I love <laughs> it. Brilliant. I've um, thoroughly enjoyed it today, uh, Jason. I do appreciate your time. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, My pleasure. Uh, it was a good conversation. I'm sure the listeners uh, will enjoy it too. Um, where, where do they uh, find, uh, I'll obviously put it in the show notes though, but talk mm-hmm. us through like your website. I think everything's on your website, isn't it? But like your podcast, yeah. YouTube, social media platforms. Yeah. So the golf guru show is the, is the podcast. Uh, you can find that on any, you know, any platform that you get your podcast, Apple, Apple podcast is kind of the most, most popular um, my handle on social is at golf guru TV, uh, which I know is kind of strange, but it came from when YouTube first came out, kind of like the podcast. I, I started a YouTube show uh, years ago called guru TV. And I just sort of turned that into my handle. And, um, so you can find me on Instagram. You can follow me on Twitter, uh, hit me up on Facebook. If you like golf, I'll, I'll friend you up. But uh, I've spent a lot of time on Instagram and Twitter, not as much on Twitter nowadays, but Instagram probably more than anything. Mm. Um, so feel free to, to reach out. My, um, and my email is golfgurutv at gmail.com. And the website's golfgurutv.net if you want to check it out. So it's got some, some videos. And uh, for coaches, I mean, there's some hidden gems on there. I've got, I used to do a, a workshop called the Guru Workshop uh, for about six or seven years at host. And I'd always have top coaches come in and I always filmed everything. And those presentations are on my website. So it's mm-hmm. like, people don't realize, I mean, I got Cameron McCormick and Claude Harmon and Mark Blackburn and, and John Sinclair. There's a lot of really great presentations on there that people don't, probably don't realize. So, but thanks for having me, man. This has been, this has been a lot of fun. It's fun to be on the other side of the mic for a change. Awesome. Great stuff. Yeah. Um, that's uh, the content on there is amazing, by the way, I, I had a look at it earlier. So um it's uh lots of nuggets so there he is again sharing he's come all the way from you know what, what we were saying earlier you were uh um yeah a lad who can't speak to people now he's a right he's a global superstar man so you, people can change i guess right if you work hard enough i love it i love <laughs> it thanks a lot for your time jason take it easy absolutely say thank you so much thank you